Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our quantitative history webinar. So today we are very happy to invite Professor Tai Su Zhang from Yale University as our speaker. Well, Professor Zhang uh, is professor of law at the Yale Law School. Uh, he mainly works on comparative legal and economic history, uh, in particular in the, in the context of China. And he has a very famous book titled The Laws and Economics of Confucianism, Kingship and Property in Pre-Industrial China and England. Uh, this book won the uh, 2018 President's Award from the Social Science History Association. Well, today, Professor Zhang will introduce uh, his new research uh, on the topic, uh, which I believe many economic historians care about. It's about the great divergence between China and the West or, or, or Western Europe. So uh, Professor Zhang will introduce the importance of the state in the rise of the modern corporation. Well, Professor Zhang will have one hour uh, to present, then we will turn to the discuss, discussion. Today, uh, we are very honored to invite our colleague, Professor Andrew Sinclair, Professor of Finance of Hong Kong U, uh, to discuss Professor John's presentation for about 10 minutes. Then we will turn to the Q&A. So for the audience, please drop your question in our Q&A box. Well, so now let's welcome Professor John. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, it's an honor to be here. And I look forward to our conversation this, uh, this evening or this morning or wherever you are. Um, so I think what I should do next is share my share my screen with you guys. So let's uh, share a screen, PowerPoint, and I'm going to go to full screen mode. All right, so um, this, the, the, this talk is titled State Building um, and the Emergence of the Business Corporation. And so um, given that I want to save as much time as I can for the, for the audience, like the most interesting part of this kind of thing for me is always uh, interacting with the audience and answering questions, I, I, I'm gonna try to basically give a very short, um, relatively shortened version of, of the presentation. So very quickly on why I began writing this paper, as those of you who, who have read some of my previous work know, like this, like you know, corporate law is not exactly my, my field of expertise. Um, I, I got into this because uh, my general realm of interest is basically, as Professor Ma mentioned, it's the quote unquote great divergence. Uh, and the angle that I come at the great divergence question basically is this problem of capital accumulation, um, which I, I think most of us would agree. Um, is necessary for the widespread use of industrial technologies. And so if, if you think about like early modern society, societies have three major routes towards adequate capital accumulation sufficient for sustaining industrialization. Um, route one is what you might call organic bottom-up accumulation. This refers for the most part um, to organic accumulation of land, mainly land, like landed assets. Uh, by richer households over small, smaller households. So basically like larger fish eating up smaller fish and eventually you snowball towards a situation where um, a, a relatively small amount of entrepreneurial families own lots and lots of land, lots and lots of capital and they turn that landed capital into financial assets uh, that then go, go towards industrialization. Like this is more or less one of the paths that you see in England and France um, during the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, the second path, which perhaps is a bit more common especially, and a bit more modern is what you might call state-driven accumulation, top-down state-driven fiscal accumulation, uh, in which the state through a combination of uh, expropriation and, and, and taxation acquires a relatively, relatively large amount, of, uh, acquires relatively large amounts of capital and then invest, invest that capital towards industrialization, uh, industrialization oriented ends. So this is, for example, like what you see in Japan after 1870. Um, it's also plays, a, the, the, this, this route is what you see in modern China post like 1950. It's what you see in Germany for the most part in the later 19th century, so on and so forth. Um, this, the third path, which feeds more directly into this, this paper, um, is accumulation by corporate joint ventures. So, 
assuming that you don't necessarily have the state playing a major role in economic accumulation and you don't have huge amounts of like organic accumulation by a few by a few by a few households um, one possibility is that one, one possibility is that you have lots of like middle-sized households that pull their, their their capital together into meet into these like large joint ventures that then have the economies of scale necessary to sustain those, to, to, to sustain industrial investments. So the way that I was basically drawing, drawing up this entire project as, as early as like seven, eight years ago um, was I, I was gonna write one book on the first route, which is organic accumulation. I was gonna write a second book on state-driven accumulation. And I was gonna write a third book on accumulation by joint corporate ventures. Um, so the first two books are finished. The first book is published. The second book is finished, at least, at least in draft form. Um, but then when I came to think about the third book, I realized that perhaps like I, I didn't have to torture myself quite so much and write, like an, write an entirely new book uh, on the history of corporate law in China and the West. Instead, I could basically just roll this, the third book perhaps into the second book. Um, because the second book comes to this conclusion and tries to explain it eventually um, that the Qing state was an unusually weak fiscal capacity state. Um, it was by far the lowest taxation uh, regime in, in imperial Chinese history. And in, in all likelihood also by far the lowest taxation regime in the early modern world. And so it came to my mind that there's a possible theoretical avenue to say that that that, that lack of fiscal capacity um, led into a lack of like overall administrative and legal capacity um, that made the formation of corporations in the Chinese context impossible, right? Because like what I want to argue basically is that all three of these routes towards capital accumulation um, were sealed off in the Chinese case uh, up until pretty much like the 1950s. Um, through a combination of institutional and cultural reasons. So once you deal with the first two routes, it, it'll be nice if I can basically find a way to, to fold the, the third route into the second route to say that the availability of corporate joint ventures uh, is dependent on the availability of large amounts of state capacity. So this begins to lead into the current question, which is why does the business corporation emerge so late in human history? Um, now, before I go into that, this claim, uh, I, I should lay out in some detail what I mean by business corporation. So we mean like by business corporation, me and my co-author, uh, John Morley, who's a colleague of mine at Yale Law School, um, we mean basically business firms with the that make use of the the the, the following legal to, what we call legal legal technologies, right? So like business firms that have the certain the, the following legal features. Um, first, they have separate legal personalities from their shareholders. Uh, second, they have collective governance structures. Third, they have joint stack joint stack equity finance. This usually eventually is paired. Um, with lock-in of investment, i.e. like once you invest in a company, there are certain barriers taking, taking your capital out. out. Um, number five is perhaps the most important thing that this paper focuses on, which is asset partition. Um, this involves two things. It involves entity shielding and limited liability. And so limited liability is the more familiar concept, but I, I imagine to most people, uh, it means that the, the financial liability of corporate shareholders vis-a-vis -vis corporate debts is limited to the amount of their investment, right? Like you can't touch my personal assets to repay the debts of any limited liability corporation that I invested. Now, entity shielding, which perhaps is even more important, does the reverse, right? It shields the corporation from my personal debts. Like no one, none of my personal debtors um, can coercively touch the capital of any firm that I invest in um, without going through a pretty difficult legal procedure. Right? Like the corporation is legally shielded from being basically preyed upon by my personal creditors. And there are weak and strong versions of this, but we'll, we'll, like when we say entity shielding, we mean we'll, we'll, what scholars have called strong entity shielding, um, which generally means that um, like no corporation can be forced to liquidate its assets uh, because of the demands of personal creditors of, of any shareholder. 
And finally, there's a sixth technology, which is free, freely tra tradable shares. This may or may not be public trading, but fr freely tradable basically means that you can sell your shares to other people um, without the express consent of your fellow shareholders and without the express consent, um, consent of the corporation um, within certain legal boundaries, of course. Uh, if you think about it, functionally speaking, freely tradable shares basically cannot exist uh, as, a, as a matter of economic function without asset partitioning. Like no one would allow freely tra tradable shares in a company that doesn't have at least entity shielding and some amount of limited liability because that would be way too risky to the, to the, to the other shareholders. Um, so basically most, most scholars who write about this think that freely tradable shares are dependent uh, upon asset partitioning. So the first four of these legal characteristics, right? Separate legal personalities, collective governance, joint stock equity finance, and investment lock-in. Um, these did exist to some extent in pre-modern forms, pre-modern firms, um, especially you know, the first three separate legal personalities, collective governance, and joint stock equity finance. Um, you find these things in firms that go back as far back as like the second, third century BC in Rome and perhaps in China as well. Uh, around the Indian Ocean as well. But the latter two, um, right, asset partitioning, especially asset partitioning being made available to private firms, um, to private business firms, and also freely tradable shares, these two things are modern phenomena. They come into existence um, basically in the 18th, 19th centuries and really not until the, the latter 19th century. Uh, in the vast majority of places on earth. So the question then is like, why did these things emerge? So did these two legal technologies and especially as a partitioning, why did this emerge so late in human history? Um, after all, if you look if you look at it, like the concept of asset partitioning was known to pre-modern business actors. Um, there are all kinds of like prototype firms. Uh, in medieval and even classical history that make use of this technology of asset partitioning, just not so much in kind of like the everyday day-to-day -day business firm context. Uh, instead, they only applied this technology in very limited circumstances um, that don't allow for large scale capital accumulation. Um, so which begs the question, given that you know of this technology and given that this technology has certain clear and obvious benefits for the facilitation of, of, of um, of, of, of capital accumulation, why don't people make more use of this um, across human history? Like, why is, it, why is this not really made available um, to the vast majority of private firms as a legal matter uh, until basically the 19th century? Um, so as you can imagine, like this is a major topic in law and economics. Um, there, there's a huge amount of literature on this kind of stuff. The, liter the literature comes uh, as a theoretical matter, basically two varieties, right? So there are demand side accounts and then there are supply side accounts. So the demand side accounts, uh, as you see, I list some authors who make these, make these arguments. Um, they largely emphasize the role that's played by inter-regional trade and commercialization, uh, basically like in the late medieval, early modern period that creates economic demand um, for the business corporation. The claim is that, um, before there were large amounts of inter-regional trade and commercialization, like there wasn't a lot of reason to have business corporations. And we're gonna give you guys some more concrete reasons, reasons to think about this um, uh, in a few minutes. But so the claim is that like, until you have this rise of inter-regional trade um, through say like Eurasian, like Eurasian trade between Western Europe and the Middle East and South Asia, uh, or perhaps in the transatlantic context, um, there's really, really not a ton of economic demand um, for these kinds of legal technologies. Now, why that is the case has not always been explained terribly clearly in this literature, but we're gonna try to kind of like give it a bit more structure. Um, the supplies, so on the other hand, in opposition to these demand side accounts, then there are a bunch of supply side accounts, right? And so, so these accounts, the reason why you call them supply side, these basically lay out various conditions um, for governmental institutions 
that must be met before you can actually have um, adequate institutional support for something like a corporation. And uh, the, the, the way that, the, that the, the literature has largely thought about this is in any kind of like a Doug North institutional like econ way, which basically is that the state must be able to make credible commitments um, to corporations that they will not arbitrarily expropriate corporate assets before people will actually be willing to pull, throw their capital into corporations. So uh, you, can, you can obviously see like the, cl the close connections between this kind of argument and the traditional Doug North kind of like credible commitment driven institutional economic theory of the rise of the West. Um, so obviously these two things are not mutually exclusive and many scholars have actually made both of these claims. So what we wanted to claim is that there are two major gaps um, in, this, in this literature, right? So first of all, the demand side conditions have to be laid out in more generally and theoretically abstract terms, um, simply because of the fact that if you think about many, many modern corporations, perhaps like the majority of modern corporations don't really engage in inter like international trade or international or trans-regional commerce, but like very often they are like lo you know, local firms of just of a very large scale, right? And like, like local industrialized in in industrialized production firms, um, lo like local industries don't necessarily have to be to, to be engaged in interregional commerce for them to want to use the corporate form. Um, so given that the modern corporation has a lot of appeal in economic contexts that have little to do with long distance trade, um, this just suggests that the proper set, set of demand side conditions that you want to look at are, are it's not long distance trade per se, but it's a set of like more abstract functional conditions that are embodied in long distance trade. And so the question is, what are those? Uh, and second, and this is the much more important takeaway um, from this from this paper, um, which is that like we think we think these accounts um, give a kind of like a too too much of a negative account of the relationship to between the, the state and the corporate form. Uh, in their eyes, the main the best thing the state can do for the rise of the corporation is to refrain from arbitrarily expropriating and to make credible commitments to that end. Um, we want to argue that the state has a more positive role to play um, towards the rise of the corporation. Um, and you know, like we want to basically argue that without what you might call functionally modern state building, uh, that leads to the rise of like a functionally modern legal system. You're not going to have the corporate form, even if the state actually can make credible commitments to not expropriate. And if there is at the same time massive amounts of long distance trade that create demand for the corporate form. Um, and the main case that we use to illustrate this is actually the Chinese case. Um, so we, like we want to argue that in late 19th century, uh, early 20th century China, you actually have both the demand side conditions and the supply side conditions that the current literature has, has, has um, identified. Not you had long distance trade creating demand, economic demand for the corporation, and you had, frankly, completely credible commitments from the Qing state to not expropriate co corporate assets. However, despite the fact that you have both of these conditions, uh, modern corporate forms do not do not emerge uh, as an economically significant phenomenon until pretty much like the 1930s, and really not until the 1970s. So what we, what we want to argue is that this shows that apart from these two conditions, which we do not deny existed, um, we, like, we do not deny these conditions are conditions. We want, to, we want to just say that there's a third condition too, which is that there has to be a sufficiently strong state with certain amounts of like modern administrative legal capacities. Um, so basically these are, um, these are the goals that we just talked about in the previous slide. Uh, empirically, our goals are a bit more modest. Like we, we want to argue the, these, these claims um, as a matter of theory, uh, as a matter of legal and economic theory. And then we want to illustrate the framework's possibility by applying it in, in relatively broad strokes to the institutional history of several major, major early modern economies, uh, China, the, the Ottoman Empire, the English and Dutch corporate context, and perhaps also the, the history of American, uh, of, of American corporate law. Uh, in the paper, we're, I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, we also show that like, you know, 
various heavily studied corporate portal types in say like Roman or medieval Italy um, to actually do not disprove um, the nature of our claims. So what we want to show is that like our theoretical claim of the state having to precede the corporation um, is consistent and plausible with all of these major case studies. We, we know of no counterexample in human history, but because we have not yet had the time to survey every single human legal system in existence and trace the, the, the chronology uh, of its corporate law vis-a-vis -vis its like, staple and introductory, uh, we cannot give a definitive empirical proof uh, because all it really takes to falsify our claim is to find one significant case of widespread use of the corporate form before there was anything resembling modern state building. Uh, we cannot claim that this such a thing does not exist because we have not surveyed the, the entirety of world history. That said, like within our, within our knowledge, like within these major case studies that we have conducted, we find no counter, um, like no counter, um, counter evidence. And in quite, quite, the opera, quite the opposite, in many of these case studies, especially the Chinese one, our theory does a better role of explaining the history um, th than the current framework. All right, so on the demand side, we want to argue that the modern business corporation emerged in response um, to demand for collaboration between large numbers of strangers um, who share residue claimant status over a business that, en that engages in complex economic activity. So I'm, 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 like, bear with me for now that this is a relatively dense um, sentence. I'm gonna unpack every, every, every part of this for you in just a second. Uh, the second claim, which actually is or is rooted in the first claim, um, which I'll show why that's that's the case in, in a minute, is that modern states contributed positively towards corporate development um, by supplying the legal and administrative infrastructure necessary to enforce incorporation and investment agreements. So much so that the rise of modern corporation was dependent uh, and continues to be dependent on what you might call modern state the rise of functionally modern states that are strong enough. Um, to enforce complex legal arrangements uniformly across relatively large territories. Um, this, functionally speaking, depends on the creation of professionalized modern judicial systems with strong informational and enforcement capacities. Now, a different way to understand why we raise these questions um, is to think about the, the following claim, right? The vast majority of economic laws, the vast majority of what you might recognize as private law um, does, not, does not necessarily rely on the existence of a modern state. Um, most of private law, right? Most of contract law, most of tort law, nearly all of property law, which is my area of expertise. Um, most of these things can be adequately sustained um, under certain conditions without any really kind of, like without any significant state intervention. And indeed existed for centuries before the, the emergence of strong state apparatuses, right? So like we mentioned before, I, I mentioned before that the corporation is, is, is a very late phenomenon uh, in human history. Well, everything else like corporate, you know, pro property contract towards uh, partnerships. These are all ancient phenomena, right? Like, you know, like you have property laws since I don't know, like the, the 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 as far as far as I, as far as I can tell, you have private property law in China since like the 15th century BC. You have private property law in Europe since like the 10th century BC, and in your in like the Middle East or in India, perhaps much earlier than that. Um, you also have contract law, tort law, like all these things and are functionally equivalents of the vast majority of modern contract rules and torts can be found in ancient law um, in large numbers. So in contrast, there are, there are, we would want to argue there are no significant examples of modern business corporations, of, of business corporations with asset partitioning. There are no significant examples of such things in pre-modern legal systems. Um, instead, they are, as, as, as I argued, uh, as, as I mentioned before, they are modern phenomena. Their emergence tends to chronologically follow the rise of modern states and the great expansion of modern formal administrative and, and, and legal capacity. But the question is why are corporations different from these other legal things, um, these other legal mechanisms, these other legal technologies in this context? 
um, in particular, like why is the corporation so different from other forms of business organization, all of which have a much longer history than the corporation? Like why is the corporation so uniquely late in human history? All right, so before I turn to that, let me just explain um, the four demands I conditions that I identified here. I, you know, like I, I said that you know, corporations arise in, in response to demand um, for collaboration between large numbers of strangers who share residual claimants that is over a business that engages in complex activity. So let's explain what, the, what I mean by these. Um, large numbers is self-explanatory. Um, there's no threshold for what sad necessarily satisfies a, a large number, but basically like the, the, the larger the number of investors, the more likely you're gonna need something like the like asset partition. Um, this is basically because you know, asset partition, if you think about it, is a form of risk aversion, as a form of like risk alleviation between, between the firm and its, and its investors. And you're likely only going to like the, the, the demand for that kind of risk alleviation. Um, it comes at a price. And we're gonna mention that in a bit. Because it comes at a price, you only need it when you really basically like have, have certain kinds of economic conditions that would make it dangerous to, to form this kind of like joint venture without these kinds of risk alleviation mechanisms. Um, large numbers is one of them. Like the more the the the, the more co-investors I have, the more likely that one of them is going to be like an untrusted or untrustworthy person who wants to mess with my economic interests, and therefore to shield against that, I want certain amount certain certain kinds of like risk alleviation mechanisms. Uh, between strangers does kind of the same thing. Between strangers basically means that the business collaborators do not all belong to the same close knit community. Like not, not everybody knows everybody else. Um, when I know everybody else, when I have a kind of a, a familiarity with them, then pres presumably the risk of doing business with these guys is low because I have all kinds of ways that I can impose uh, reputational and material sanctions on them for violating our agreements and so on and so forth. Um, when the when my co-investors are more socially distant from me, however, um, when they are strangers, this these kinds of like informal uh, punishment punishment mechanisms begin to become unavailable, and hence you want various kinds of risk alleviation shields. Um, Residual claimants refer to the economic agents who, quote unquote, this is I'm just drawing this from like the the major legal textbook on on this issue. It's economic agents who possess remaining claims on an organization's net cash flows after the the, the, the deduction of precedent agents' claims, and therefore bear the residue risk of the, the operations. Right. So what this means. Uh, is that in a corporation, so like I can lend money to a corporation and the corporate the corporation guarantees my debt based on its assets. Um, that would make me a precedent agent, not a residue one, because my um, like me getting repaid is guaranteed as a matter of collateral. All right. Instead, if I'm a, compare that with like the investor in the corporation, somebody who owns stock, um, like upon payment of like ass like like payment of dividends or liquidation of the corporation like the, the shareholders only get their money um after the corporation has paid off all its liabilities um especially like all its secure liabilities right so what like the investors bear the residue risk of the the operations now the the reason why this is important is that residue claimants bear much higher risk uh, in the corporation than say preceded than, than a precedent agent. Like if, if I'm a secured creditor of the corp of the corporation, as long as the corporation has adequate financial assets to pay my debts, I bear no risk whatsoever. Um, however, like the, the shareholder bears a lot of risk because his or her financial returns depend on the corporation's everyday operations and so on and so forth. So residue claimants also gets at this basic matter of risk, and therefore, if you are a residue claimant, you're more likely to, you're you're more you're much more likely to have a certain kind of demand for risk alleviation technologies. Um, now, complexity is something that's a little bit, um, I guess, pun intended, more complex to find. It basically refers to the lack of full foreseeability. 
uh, in the firm's activities. So a complex business, business, business operation is one in which you know, it's impossible to fully, fully plan for all contingent decision-making ahead of time. Uh, makes it, impossible, it makes it impossible to fully account for the, business, the, the corporation's returns and liabilities in this a priori manner by contract. And like, I can't fully guarantee you what's gonna happen with the corporation. I can't tell you with 100% certainty through a con, I can't promise you through, through contract, this is how the corporation is gonna be run. These are all the activities it's, it's gonna be doing. Um, so, you know, like compare, for example, you know, like just like the act of selling a good like all, if all I do is like, I'm a retail seller, but I take other people's stuff and I sell it to other people. I can do it at a very large scale, but the activity itself is relatively simple. Like all I'm doing is taking one person's thing and selling, selling it to somebody else. Um, compare that with say the, finan the, the business, business activities of like a law firm or an investment bank. The kind of business that those things inherently engage with is inherently complex, right? Like there's no way to plan for what kind of advice you're gonna to have to give as a lawyer or as, an, or as a financial advisor, a priori, you're gonna to have to like handle that case by case. There's no one single mode of like how you operate as a lawyer or as a, as an investment analyst or, 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 so, or something of that sort. Like similarly assume that you know, like I'm, I'm a producer of like a high tech product that like that kind of production is, is inherently more complex than say like if, if all I did was like manufacture chairs. Um, so the claim here is that the more complex um, the business operations are, the more you know, contingent decisions they involve, um, the more the corporation is risky to its investors and the more they're likely going to have to the more likely they're going to want to elevate their risk um, through asset protection. Um, so our argument basically is the business corporation rel so like our argument that you know the modern state functionally precedes the business corporation, you have to understand this argument within the context of these demands like conditions. Right? It's precisely because the business corporation was designed to coordinate long-term or, or complex investment or dense investment. Um, between large numbers of strangers, the modern state building was required to sustain it. Um, the external conditions, therefore, that create uh, large amounts of economic demand for the corporate form also make it functionally reliant on modern state building. Um, to understand this argument, um, consider the kind of like alternatives to the corporation that you might otherwise have. Like what, like what are the alternatives to the state um, if you want to enforce like a corporate charter? Um, two come to mind, and these two also tend to basically be the dominant kind of creators and enforcers of economic rules and regulations uh, in, in early modern economic, economic life. The first thing is customary self-governance within close-knit communities, right? So within a village, a lineage, and so on and so forth, you have large amounts of, usually you have large amounts of customary law being made and enforced with much rigor. Uh, and, and the second kind is what you might call kind of like interregional merchant networks, inter interregional economic networks of like brokers, arbitrators, something like the medieval law merchants, which offers like interregional networks of trade to form based on like a common set of rules. Um, the, for, the former, especially if you think about like, you know, like within close modern communities, um, within these close to pre modern communities, you have ex actually extremely complex legal institutions. Um, that you have you know, virtually all kinds of property institutions, like all, nearly all the forms of modern property ownership you see in pre modern, like in pre -modern communities being enforced uh, by these close knit communities you see very complex mortgage relationships that functionally speaking are not so different from ideal type wise the corporation. Um, they're, they're, they're like these close knit communities are capable of, of creating and enforcing extremely complex legal institutions, including various kinds of partnerships. Um, however, what those communities don't seem to have as a matter of historical description is they don't seem to 
be, be in the business of enforcing various kind, like anything that really resembles a, a business corporation. They don't seem to enforce entity shielding for the firm, and they don't seem to uniformly grant, like they, they don't they don't seem to be willing to like uniformly grant limited liability to investors on any kind of like large scale. Now you might think, okay, maybe, maybe perhaps this is because like modern business corporations with asset partition, they're just like too complex and too difficult to enforce um, for the close in the community. Now, if you think about like, this is not actually the case, like why would that necessarily be the case? Um, it could, like within the close in the community, if you have like mutually acquainted investors, for the most part, like you can enforce extremely complex rules. Um, that many of which are functionally at least as complex as a modern business corporation. Like, you know, say to take the Chinese countryside as an example, and Chinese lineages enforce mortgage rules that were like mind-bogglingly complex. Frankly, far more complex than your than your usual modern mortgage. And so, like, they did this on a large scale with huge, like, with with high, like, high levels of, of regularity and consistency. And as far as like legal functionality and complexity goes, like it's very hard to argue the modern corporation was somehow more complex than that. All of the things that are complicated about, about the modern business corporation, like you know, governance and so on and so forth, you see those kinds of things being enforced all the time in these early modern communities. The thing that the, these early modern communities don't have is asset partitioning, but asset partitioning, if you think about it, it's, it's not that complex a thing. Limited liability just means telling creditor, um, to like telling creditors of the firm that you can't touch the business assets, uh, the, the personal assets of uh, firm investors, and entity shouldn't does the opposite. It's like a, it's just like a relatively simple debt relationship intervention. That functionally speaking is not that is not much, is not more complex at all than most kinds of mortgages. Um, so, like you know, like, we're not going to have time to go fully into this argument, but it's it seems quite unlikely that as a, just as a matter of like legal functionality, um, these pre-modern close-knit communities can't enforce, like aren't capable of, of enforcing a business corporation. Um, like they're not capable of enforcing asset partition. That's not that's not the case. Instead, what you what we want to argue instead is that like within the, the boundaries of a close in the community, you're not going to have any demand um, for a business corporation. You're not going to have, in particular, you're not going to have any demand for asset partitioning and especially not for entity shielding. Right. Um, now, the, the reasons um, of this, let me just kind of, kind of go into this in, 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 a, in a small amount of detail. The reasons for this are, are, are the following. Right? If you think about the way that asset partition and limited liability work, what, what they're basically involved in is removing some risk from either from investors and the firm and passing that risk on to third party creditors. Now, these creditors can either be so called contract creditors, i.e., somebody who lends the firm or its investors money and signs a contract to that effect, or tort investors. Then, you know, somebody, somebody who's wronged by the tort as a matter like wronged by the corporation as a matter of tort. You know, this the, the latter kind would be like, you know, the corporation engages in some kind of like economically harmful activity that does harm to unexpected third parties and therefore creates the, you know, like these, these, these unexpected, unexpected amounts of like third party externalities. Um, by removing a lot of the financial risk from the firm investor relationship. Now that, that risk has to go somewhere, right? So instead of like what these technologies do is it passes that risk onto the outside world, onto various kinds of third party creditors. And because it does that, right, you know, the third party creditors are not going to be happy with this and they want to push back. One way they push back is by imposing higher borrowing costs on the firm. But that, that, that helps you know, like contract creditors who lend you money um, deal with the extra risk created by asset partition. However, now what about third party tort, um, like, um, like third party tort externalities? That kind of thing is basically borne by the community at large, right? 
so the thing is like, unless you give the community a large enough economic reason to take on that risk, they're like the community at large does not want to take on like that kind of extra risk. Why can the corporation commit certain kinds of economic harms against me? And I, I can't sue its, its investors as a, like in a personal capacity. That seems to be, that seems to be limiting my, 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 my personal options. And especially in closely knit communities, right? Like the community is a cohesive enough unit that if it wants to push back against this thing and say, okay, you can't do this and you can't pass on these through party externalities to me, it can do so, right? So the claim is that because of these third party externalities, unless there is a large enough economic rationale that the, the corporation does enough economic good, um, there's just not a lot of re reason to have a corporation. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of reason to have asset protection. And going back to the demand side conditions, the corporation with asset protection only does a, a substantial, like, irreplaceable amount of economic goods under these demand side conditions, only in conditions in which large amounts of strangers are collaborating as investors, residue claimant investors in complex economic activities, is the corporation necessarily superior to say partnerships or other firms? Um, and, the and this is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, like, in only in those kinds of like really high risk scenarios will the risk alleviation mechanisms introduced through asset protection really be valuable. Because otherwise, if you're just doing business with a bunch of like mutually acquainted people in a close knit community, you tend to know each other, right? Like the, the, the stranger condition is not met. And when the stranger condition is not met, like the, the economic benefits of having, having asset protection, protection aren't terribly large. Which means that within a close knit community in which everyone knows each other, there's not that much reason to bear the third party externality costs of asset protection. All right, so hence, like, you know, like you're not going to, like, even though close knit communities are capable of enforcing something like a corporation as a matter of just core legal functionality, they don't have any economic reason to do so. Right now, instead, so so, which means that like you're only really going to have enough demand for something like the corporation when you cross community boundaries. Like this goes back to the demand side condition that the current literature relies upon, like long distance trade. But like when you're moving across close knit communities, you need something like the firm um, to help you alleviate risk. Now, when you're doing that. Right, like the, um, there, prior to the rise of the modern state, there basically was only one major legal alternative to the close knit community, which was you know, like these law merchant interregional networks, um, which allowed networks of merchants across different regions to come together in a somewhat loosely organized form and enforce some basic rules. So I, I realize I, I, should, I should probably speed up a little bit here. Um, the 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 thing, but but the thing about like the, these these like these 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 interregional commercial networks is that even though you know they, they had like this kind of like interregional cross network reach that close knit communities don't have, they're actually much weaker in terms of their coercive powers. Right, like they they're they're not like the state that has like a a uniform strong course of power across large geographical regions. Uh, instead, you know, like these networks, if you if, even if you just move beyond like a, a county or two, you're going to be dealing with you know a bunch of merchants and so on and so forth. That yes, they kind of interact with each other, but it's, it's kind of like a loose loose relationship. Uh, and because these law merchants are not governmental entities that have you know, their own military, they have their own monopolization of violence. Um, they have very obvious limitations on coercive capacity. So this limits both the scale and the complexity of interregional collaboration. And what, what I mean by that is without that kind of like uniform course of power uh, across large geographical regions, these networks can only enforce relatively simple agreements. So what this means is you know, they, can, they can enforce contracts, but something that's as complex as a corporation, they have a hard time actually enforcing this. So what this means is that there, there's kind of like, a, like prior to the rise, the rise of the modern state, there's a trade-off between what you might call social distance um, and contingency and complexity. 
in these alternative decentralized regimes. Right? Socially proximate actors within a close knit community, you can engage in collaborative activities that involve huge amounts of com complexity and contingency. However, socially distant ones are more often limited to simpler and more predictable forms of collaboration. So basically sales of goods um, instead of say like an actual joint venture in which like everyone's co-investing in a complex business activity, such as for example, production of machinery or even production of textiles and so on and so forth. Instead, it's like limited to like exchange of goods. Um, so essentially like, you know, like either you have close knit communities which are legally powerful within their own boundaries and they can enforce all kinds of complex legal arrangements. However, this comes at the cost of being quite limited in social and geographical reach, or you have these merchant networks that are much more expansive in social and geographical reach, but are much more limited in their legal enforcement capacity, and therefore they're, they're limited to enforcing relatively simple agreements. So the, what, what from this perspective, like what the modern state uniquely supplies is the ability to actually have your pie and eat it at the same time, to actually have both. You can both at the same time have highly contingent complex legal relationships and business relationships, but at the same time have that on a large scale, like have that across people who don't know each other uh, across different regions. All right, so now of course, like why is the modern states um, uniquely um, well suited to doing this? Well, this is, you know, like what we all know about the modern state, you know, they cover large territories um, because of their monopolization. So like the, the definition of a modern state is one that, monop that, that, success that successfully monopolizes violence. All right, so that centralization of violence and coercive capacity gives them a measure of legal, that like gives them the ability to impose legal uniformity across relatively large territories. Um, hence, they have large powers of enforcement. They're, they're able to reliably enforce judgments against um, people despite, regardless, regardless of their like, social proximity to, to the judge. All right, so what this means is you know, like, that modern states are because of their coercive powers, um, they're also able to impose a far greater amount of formalization um, within uh, amongst its agents, right? So um, to kind of give you an example, right? So, so, so if you're in doing business with somebody else who belongs to a close-knit community that you don't belong to, like no matter how that person promises, okay, I'm not gonna cheat you. I'm not gonna like screw you out of your, your investments. Like if the, if the the law enforcement right over your agreement is given to his community, then it's very hard for me to really be comfortable with his community enforcing your business agreements when only one of you guys is an insider to that community. Now, if you had like a some kind of close friend in that community that would that would offer you certain kinds of like kind of like a semi insider status to that community, you might be more comfortable. But what if you're like what if you're a complete stranger? Then you, like it's just almost impossible for that close in the community because of its lack of social ties to you to credibly convey that it's going to treat you fairly and not 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 cheat you in rule enforcement. But the thing about modern states is that like regardless of how socially proximate the, the investors are to, to either to each other or to the person doing the rule enforcement, the judge, modern states, because of their, their greater powers of enforcement and coercion are capable of enforcing a measure of like legal formality. They can guarantee the judge will treat these guys in kind of like an impartial formalistic fashion. And they do this by, by subjecting the judge to harsh punishments if, the, the judge the judge has ever discovered to not 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 uh, perform that role. All right. So what this means is that you know, modern states are uniquely um, able to provide strong credible guarantees to investors that they will be treated equally by the law enforcement apparatus, even though they are even if they are not socially connected to, to those who actually run the apparatus. Now, why is this especially important? Now, you think about well, it's like given that stockholders are by nature residual claimants over firm assets, um, their willingness to invest depends very, very strongly on receiving strong, strong guarantees of equal treatment within the terms of their investment agreements. Like when I'm a residue claimant, I really need to make sure that at least I'm treated this the same way as all other residual claimants are, um, subject to the relative, relative share of our, 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 our stocks, right? 
like I, I'm already at a disadvantage compared to to to, to, to you know, secured asset creditors. I must get like because of the 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 uncertainty that I'm taking on as a resident claimant, I must be treated equally compared to other resident claimants. So as we, as I just mentioned, this is this is something that you, that you know, local, local communities can supply to connect the insiders. They can, they can they can supply to their own members as long as every investor of the firm is an insider. But the moment that you draw an outsider in. Like because no one in the community has ties to the outsider, right? Assuming that's the case, you can't guarantee. Like there, there's no way to credibly commit co co commit to the outsider, right? You know, in contrast, the modern the the the, 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 the political foundations of modern states and legal systems tends tends to be more in person and formal. Um, to use the Berian terminology, it's like much more gazelle shaft instead instead of gemein shaft. This gives, us, this gives us certain kinds of qualities, uh, formalization, institutional predictability, and transparency that helps and make credible commitments to both insiders and outsiders. Now, it should be noted that right? you know, these are not the kinds of credible commitments that you see in the current literature. Like we don't, by, by credible commitments, we don't mean credible commitments to not expropriate. We mean credible commitments to treat everybody the same, to, to, to give everybody the same level of legal service. All right, so this leads to our conclusions, right? The modern state's ability to credibly commit to, the, to, equal, to equal legal treatment of investors combined with its information and enforcement advantages across large uh, socially distant territories allows it to institutionally support the formation and operation of business corporations by large groups of strangers. This is, as discussed above, um, something that pre-modern legal or customary systems are not able to provide. And hence, functionally speaking, the rise of modern states should, in theory, precede the economically significant emergence of modern business corporations and visibly play a major role in facilitating the rise. Now, the flip side of this is that there are certain kinds of legal institutions, such as asset partitioning, that really are only useful in what you might call you know, social economic relationships between strangers, only useful in socially proximate and in socially non-proximate relationships. Um, as we mentioned, that most kinds of private law have functional equivalents in pre-modern customary law. However, you know, some do not. There's a subset of modern laws that are exclusively modern. Right? Corporate law is like this. Bankruptcy is like this. Public trusts are like this. And so what we want to basically say is that like, this theoretical framework helps you identify which kinds of legal institutions are useful in both kind of like the mine shaft and gazelle shaft contexts are useful in both stranger societies and close societies, and which kinds of legal institutions are really only ever useful in stranger-based societies. Like what we want to argue is that there's a class of legal institutions, such as the modern corporate form and perhaps modern bankruptcy law, that are only useful in social, in, in, in the context of business, of, of relationships between strangers. And this gives you like a much, more functionally interesting way of cutting up this this big pie of private law into functionally distinct um, categories than than what we've had in the literature up to this point. So, using my last two minutes, I'm just going to introduce like what quickly illustrate um, why our framework can do a better job of explaining large swaths of uh, corporate history than the current than the than, pre, than the pre existing framework. Right. So. So the best example for us is the Chinese example. Um, prior to 1903, there was essentially no um, concept of asset partitioning in Chinese business relationships. So it was like the, the dominant form of business dealing with was family firms. These were full liability firms that didn't either use limited liability or asset part or, or entity shielding. However, you know, like especially towards the, the, the later part of the 19th century, there is a lot of like demand for interregional trade, right? China is a highly complex commercialized society in which there's a lot of interregional trade. Um, but these this trade is not done by corporations, instead, it's done by, by family firms and joint ventures. Right. So this would seem to show that you know, just long distance trade on its own is not enough to produce the rise of the corporation. At the same time, the other major condition that the current literature identifies, i.e. the um, ability to make credible commitments to not expropriate, actually that exists throughout most of the Qing. Why does that exist? It's because the Qing state is um, 
basically because of its extremely low fiscal capacity, it, it's arguably one of the lowest regimes you could ever imagine in the pre-modern world in terms of coercive capacity. The Qing regime is not a regime with any significant amount of coercive capacity. It can't force local communities for the most part to really do anything. Now, which means that you know, like, if you think about like government expropriation of corporate assets relies on the government's being at least relatively strong in terms of course of capacity, like for me to expropriate your assets means that I have to be able to do so. But based on most accounts of Qing state capacity, there's a very strong argument to be made that frankly, the Qing, the, the Qing state after let's just say like 1780, just didn't really have the coercive capacity at the local level to really engage in any kind of significant asset expropriation. Like there are really no examples of the things they're trying to seize private assets for the simple reason that it was too miserably weak to do so because it lacked the financial muscle to even like pay its local local officials to sustain them in a, to sustain them in a fashion. They actually would have large amounts of course of capacity, right? So like both of the conditions that the current literature identifies, long distance trade and the ability to make credible commitments to not expropriate corporate assets exist in the mid to late Qing. However, there is no introduction of asset partition. At the same time, the, 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 the concept of asset partition is introduced in, my, in, in, the, in the 1903 court company, right? Um, this this uh, Da Xing Gong Si after it's introduced, for roughly 30 years after it's introduced, virtually no one actually makes use of this new asset protection reform. Like it's very sparsely used and when it's used, the corporation is very often fair. Um, if it was used, it was mainly used in like a few large urban centers with relatively strong state capacity, say like Shanghai, for example, like everywhere else in the country, no one used this. Which again, that's the reason. Okay, if you said okay, before 1903, at least no one tried to introduce as a, as a legal matter this concept of asset protection. After 1903, there it's like fully legal, right? Like no one's, everyone's saying like just do this. Like you, it's made, it's made available on a, on a regular basis to every private company in the in the country. But like virtually no one actually makes use of it. Like the amount of companies um, that make use of asset protection and make use of the corporate form prior to the 1930s is like something like 0.1% like of all firms in the country. So why is that, right? Like this is not something that the current literature can actually explain because both of these conditions did, did exist. In fact, they exist before 1903. But we can explain this because, you know, like until the, the 1930s, there was no significant staple in China, right? Like state capacity did not begin to rise even in like in secondary urban centers to the level of kind of like the state was able, like the state did not have the ability to uniformly enforce laws in most parts of like rural China or suburban China until the 1930s. Until then it relied basically on self-governance um, from rural communities, which was largely based on the, done on the basis of customer. So it's not until state building in the 1930s and then much later <coughs> under the Chinese Communist Party after 1949, that China has a strong enough state to provide the adequate institutional foundation for the widespread use of the corporate form, right? Like, again, like prior to that, all, your, all, these, all the complex rule enforcement in China was being done within these like decentralized close knit communities. But under, in those communities, you don't really have much need um, for asset partitioning. You do have need for asset partitioning in terms of regional commerce, but without the state, there's not a strong law enforcement entity that can actually handle interregional com commerce. So hence, you don't really see the corporation taking off in China until the 1930s and really not until after 1980. Um, the other case studies that we talk about, you know, England, the U.S., the, the Ottoman Empire, and so on and so forth, um, these are all just discussed in the paper mainly to show that there are no counterexamples, right? So in all of these cases, like this, these states are not, um, I guess, just to use the word dumb enough, 
um, to try to introduce the corporate form before they engage in a modern state building. Like China is the only country that frankly was dumb enough to do this. Um, and because these other, it, but, but, the, but what that means is, is that, that you know, in, these, in these other states, the, the social economic rise of the corporation and in fact, even the legal introduction of the corporation always takes place after the rise of modern state building. Prior to that, you, know, you think about things like the, the, the English East India Company, the corporate form usually is only made available to firms that are directly backed by the state, which further speaks to the prominent role that the state played in the rise of the corporation. All right. So that basically is my entire argument. And uh, I'm going to stop the sharing right now. And I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Professor Zhao. So now let's turn to our discussion session. So Professor Andrew Sinclair uh, from Department of Finance of Hong Kong U Business School uh, will uh, uh, discuss for about 10, maybe even 15 minutes before we turn to the Q&A from the audience. So, Andrew. All right, uh, well, uh, Dr. John, or Professor John, thanks very much for coming to, to present. This was a very interesting paper. Uh, Chu Chan and Professor Chen, thanks very much for inviting me to discuss this uh, very interesting paper. Uh, so I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, the economic institutions that underpin uh, society. Uh, and so for this paper, I think it's, um, I think there's a very important question here. And so if you think about the idea of the corporation, if you think about, you know, one of the biggest questions right now is why is the corporation become so socioeconomically predominant? You know, why is it the case that everything is now structured uh, as a corporation? Like uh, Taisu, we were talking earlier about how even the penal system, you know, the prison system in America is structured as a corporation. If you think about the original uh, innovation of the corporate structure, it was to finance trade. It was to finance long distance, long-term, large-scale uh, trade. But now it's come, to, it's come to dominate every single industry. Every single industry is structured uh, as a corporation. And so then the question becomes, you know, what are the institutions that are necessary for the corporation uh, to thrive? And so in this paper, you know, you argue that it's not just the laws. We don't just need corporate laws, but we also need uh, enforcement. And in a sense, like that, that makes a lot of, I mean, in, in a sense, that's tautologically true, right? It's like, of course, you know, if you have the laws and there's no enforcement, then the laws don't matter. Um, but I think, you know, if you think about this within the legal literature, like what is the, what is the puzzle here? And I think the puzzle is that historically, if you think about private law, you know, private law was enforceable locally. Um, and so then the question becomes, why was it the case that the corporation, corporate law could not be enforced uh, locally? Why was it the case that we needed to develop uh, an institution in order, uh, to, in order to support corporations? Um, and here in the paper, you know, you argue it's that we need to have this large state uh, and through the large state, we can end up developing the legal system. You can, we can have a professional legal system uh, for enforceability. And so I was thinking a little bit more about why is it the case that, you know, if we're in this Gemeinschaft world where everything is sort of local, we have, you know, robust laws, we have laws that can be very well enforced, but everything uh, depends on the local institutions. Um, you know, why is it the case that a corporation can't exist there? Why is it the case that a corporation doesn't arise? And I think at the end of the day, um, liquidity ends up becoming a very important factor here. So if you think about a corporation being very long-lived, you know, we need to raise capital for this project. The project is very long-lived and we need to raise capital from a, a lot of different people. If I invest in this project, one of the concerns that I have is that I want to be able to exit. You know, the concern for any investor is how do I get out of this? And if we're in a world where laws are enforceable only locally, it limits the set of people that I can sell uh, my shares to. It, it limits my exit opportunity. I can only exit to people that are under the same jurisdiction. Now, if instead we were in a Gesellschaft world where you know, we could have interactions 
uh, across different cities, across large geographies, across strangers. Uh, in that case, I can sell my shares to anybody. And this really, you know, this ends up being very important because what, what, what is necessary for these shares to be tradable is that we need to have uh, impartial adjudication. You know, it needs to be the case that anybody in the system is treated equally. If it's the case that the cash flows that accrue to my shares depend on the identity of the shareholder, then I can't trade these shares to anybody else. But if everybody is considered equal under this legal framework, then these, then these shares can be very easily tradable. And so I think, you know, if we think about why is it the case that you need this sort of national legal system? Why do you need uh, this tra transition from the Gemeinschaft world to the Gesellschaft world? Uh, I think liquidity ends up becoming very important. The fact that these shares can actually be tradable. And without that, you know, we're not gonna have uh, like large, the ability to raise capital uh, on a very large scale. And so, okay. And so going into the paper, I think, you know, the way you argue uh, the paper, you know, there's sort of two points in the existing literature. So one is uh, the demand side. And so the demand side, I thought that the existing literature explains the rise, or not, not the rise of the corporation, but the innovation, the initial innovation of the corporation. So if you think about going from like the Roman commenda to the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company, you know, here it was like a very specific financial innovation that allowed us to finance long distance trade. Um, but I think, you know, one of your contributions is that you're not focusing just on the initial innovation of the corporation, but what allowed the corporation to become, you know, predominant, to become ubiquitous. Uh, and it's really, you know, this idea that we can pool capital across a large scale of people. You know, if you think about the initial corporation, the initial innovation of the corporation was really about the age of discovery. It was about, you know, international trade. But the current form of the corporation, the reason the corporation has become so ubiquitous, um, a lot of that has to do with the industrial revolution. You know, it has more to do with the fact that now we need large scale, or now we have the benefit of large scale capital combined with uh, machinery you know, we can take advantage of, uh, of the economies of scale. And so I think, you know, one important contribution uh, of your framework is for explaining how we got from the initial innovation of the corporation uh, to the proliferation of the corporation. Um, in the paper, when you talk about the supply side story, when you talk about, uh, you know, basically this uh, need to prevent against expropriation, the negative relationship that's documented in the literature uh, between the corporation and the state. Um, I think there you have to be a little bit careful because if you think about the developmental history of the corporation, expropriation is maybe more of a concern um, in the earlier stages of development. Like if we think about expropriation, it's really a story about property rights. It's a story about you know, the elites, uh, you know, the elite landowners that, that took the autocratic ruler and brought them under uh, the rule of law. You know, it's like subjugating the, the autocratic ruler to the rule of law. Um, and so that's, in a sense, that's a development that takes place a long time before the, the rise of the corporation. Um, if you think about the more recent literature that talks about, you know, the relationship between the corporation and the state, a lot of this literature was written in the 20th century, and it was more of a discussion about given that we already have a legal system in place, what is the optimal size of the government? You know, this was more of a discussion about capitalism versus uh, like market socialism. Uh, it was more of a discussion about what is the optimal role of the government. And in, in that sense, you know, the, the law and finance literature that talks about, um, the law and finance literature that talks about like the legal origins in a sense, they're already assuming uh, the world that, they're already assuming that the legal system exists. You know, they're already assuming a sufficiently powerful state. And so, you know, I think what you're doing is you're filling in that gap in the middle uh, where, you know, you're asking, how is it the case that we can actually develop this gazelle shaft world where we have the system in place that will allow uh, for corporations to thrive? Um, now, going to the specific case of China, um, 
you know, thinking about the end of the Qing dynasty, the early Republic era, uh, I thought that this was an interesting case study because, you know, it does have uh, this large demand for corporations, you know, for, for large scale business enterprises. Uh, you know, there's a lot of trade both domestically and internationally. Uh, we're already into the industrial revolution. So ideally, you know, economies of scale would be very, very important. Um, with the introduction of the corporate law, um, you know, people have op the option to, to build their corporations, um, but as you argued, you know, there's no sort of enforcement mechanism in place. What I wonder about, though, is if the enforcement mechanism was in place, how much would this really change things? How much would it convince people to change from the existing system that they were using, you know, mostly thinking about, you know, clan-based uh, businesses? Uh, to switching over to the corporation. And the reason I ask this is because uh, Stephanie Chung, she has an interesting paper from 2010 where she looks at the Chinese Tang, uh, the Chinese Tangs in British Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, uh, the company's ordinance was passed in 1865. And for the first, for the first 45 years, uh, it was mostly used by foreigners. There were only 10 Chinese companies that were registered with the company's ordinance. Uh, by 1910. Uh, she looks at a bunch of um, legal cases that took place in the 1910s about uh, you know, trying to understand what is the legal status of a Chinese tongue uh, in, with regards uh, to the, the company's ordinance. Um, but even after, even after those legal cases that showed that the tongue essentially has no legal representation, uh, we didn't see a huge shift from tongues uh, to corporations. From 1920 to 1937, there were only 60 Chinese uh, firms that were registered in Hong Kong. Uh, so even though, you know, in this 72 year period, there was this, you know, legal system with strong enforcement, um, a lot of people just chose not to embrace this new system. Uh, so even though it was there, uh, we didn't see uh, that movement. And, um, you know, as we mentioned earlier uh, in our chat before today's talk, uh, with Professor Chen and, and uh, Chi Chang, we have a paper where we look at uh, the expansion of modern banks in, in early 20th century China. So these were structured as corporations. And what we see is that in areas where the Confucian clan was strong, where finance took place through the Confucian clan, uh, that these uh, institutions, that these corporations, that these banks weren't able to compete, that, that people chose not to adopt uh, this new system. And they chose to stick with the system that they, uh, that they knew fairly well. Um, now, this is all, this is not to say that, you know, that I don't believe your story. You know, I believe your story. I think enforcement, without enforcement, there really isn't uh, any corporation. Like, it's incredibly important. Um, I just think that there might be other uh, factors at play as well. Now, in the paper, you talk about what happens during reform and opening up. That, you know, over the past few years in China, we've seen, you know, essentially the proliferation of corporations, that, uh, that most of the GDP in China is produced in private corporations. Um, and if you think about the past 10 years in China, you know, there's been huge reforms uh, specifically focused on enforceability and impartial adjudication. Uh, so, you know, in the past 10 years, the central government's been trying to create an environment where you know, small firms, they can bring each other to court, they can have business disputes, they can have them settled, uh, and everything is sort of clear uh, and, and transparent. But that's also an innovation that's mostly over the past 10 years. You know, if I think about the rise of the corporation in China, this was something that took place in the 1980s and the 1990s. But when I talk to people that were alive uh, in China at that time, and I asked them about you know, what was the what was like the environment like, the, the, the corporate environment like? And they said it was like the Wild West. You know, people were, were going after any type of investment. They were doing anything. It, it makes me question exactly how much, inf how enforceable uh, were, these, were these contracts at the time. Yet at the same time, we saw like, the huge expansion of the corporation. It, it almost makes me think that in the specific case of China, you know, why did we see uh, the, the widespread uh, distribution of or growth uh, of these corporations, it almost makes me feel like the government said, we want to have corporations, and people said, we're going to make corporations. You know, it's like the leader leads and the people follow uh, sort of idea. And so I, I, I guess I wonder, you know, how much of it was due to uh, inf like the creation of the system that has 
enforceable contracts versus just the will of the government and people realizing that they could go ahead and do this and it would be prosperous for them to do it um, even if they weren't necessarily thinking about concepts of, uh, of enforceability. Um, but I think, you know, generally, I, I, I think the whole paper is very interesting. Um, I think there's also an aspect here where you're thinking about, you know, why is it the case that different societies had the ability to make the jump from a, uh, from a Gemeinschaft world to a Gesellschaft world? Um, if you think about the, the Avner Graf and Guido Tavolini work, you know, where they look at how Europe, uh, you know, solved the problem of co cooperation versus how China solved the problem of cooperation. In China, you know, it was all based on kinship morality that, you know, I'm not going to betray you if we're brothers because we have these obligations. Uh, but in the West, there was this general form of morality. Um, but and because it was so weak, it required the development uh, of legal institutions. And all, all I really mean there is that when you're making the jump from the Gemeinschaft world to the Gesellschaft world in the West, the economic cost of making that jump was already was much smaller because they had already built up a lot of the institutions needed. Whereas in China, in a sense, you were starting from scratch. Like, like, like another way of thinking about this is in China, we have a, a strong state uh, during like the period of reform and opening up. And you can ask, like, you know, is it the strong state that's led to the spread of the corporations? But another channel that might uh, that this might go through is that the strong state has also destroyed the clan. You know, in 1949, the clan was made illegal. In the Cultural Revolution, there was this big war against uh, Confucianism, and the one-child policy also prohibit or makes it difficult to have uh, large clans. So at the same time, you know the the sort of expansion of the corporation, I don't know how much of it is because of the strength of the legal system. I mean, I know it's definitely there, it's definitely going to be important, um, but I also wonder how much of it has to do with uh, essentially like the, 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 the decline of the clan uh, and that how that is a lot more costly uh, than the than sort of the, uh, the reforms that were needed in Europe uh, to get to the Gesellschaft world. Okay, so I think, those were all the comments I, I had uh, for today, but you know, I really like the paper. I think it's a fantastic paper uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to discuss it. So thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. So Professor Zhang, do you want to make some quick response? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so so for, uh, first of all, like, thank you very much for those questions. Um, th th those are really useful questions. I, I, I think I took down all of them and uh, they're, they're, they're very helpful for, for pulling us on, on, on some of the core things that I, we have to for, um, further polish. So I, I just want to make three quick responses. Um, first is like, how do you go from the Gemeinschaft world to the Gesellschaft world? Um, I basically don't have, like this paper is not, but basically like this, this paper is not about explaining why you go for, from the Gemeinschaft world to the Gesellschaft world. It's basically like our, our, our angle of entry is that like once you're in the Gesellschaft world, and you're, deal, you're, 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 you're engaging in this kind of like economic collaboration that you wouldn't be doing in the Gemeinschaft world. What do you need to have large scale collaboration? Um, and like, like my personal idea of like why you go from the Gemeinschaft to the Gesellschaft is that it's not always well, it's not always voluntary and very often it's completely involuntary. Um, it's sometimes it's forced upon you by, by shocks and contingencies, by crises. Um, the Black Death, for example, made huge, huge parts of Europe kind of like less, less Gemeinschaft than they used to be and like laid the foundations of a Gesellschaft world. The thing is that, you know, like Gemeinschaft worlds have a tendency to become a comfortably, comfortably self-produced because they are, they can be like, you know, highly efficient, prosperous worlds. Um, like you only you only go from Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft in the aftermath of like large shocks, famines, uh, plagues, wars, and so on and so forth, or in some cases like major technological upgrades and so on and so forth. And it, it's you know, in, in many parts of the region the transition is completely involuntary. It's forced upon them. Uh, and so hence, like our question is not why you transition; it's what happens after you transition. Or like what, like once you've made the transition, what are the institutional steps you have to you have to take? Uh, 
um, to make sure the economy continues to function at relatively high capacity. Um, on the two kind of like China Chinese oriented sort of questions you raised, like those are great questions. Um, on the Chinese tongues, like I, I read that paper quickly, but I, I should probably go back and read it more carefully. Like my impression was that you can explain the lack of take up of the corporate form largely through demand sides. Um, like variations, right? So foreign firms are, like, especially, you know, Hong Kong is not a major trading center for quite some time after it was taken over the, by the British. Um, for the first half century, like the foreign firms were, were pretty much like the only major players in Hong Kong that were dealing with like you know, truly inter-regional commerce and large scale business still um, dealing with like local firms were relatively small. Um, they were kind of comfortably situated within the family. So the thing is like, you know, the nature of the business that was handled by the foreign firms was likely quite different from that handled by, by, by most of the local firms. And which would suggest that, you know, like just as our theory would predict and as other, others would predict, there likely wasn't that much demand for the corporate firm, uh, for, for the corporate firm amongst a lot of local firms in Hong Kong. It's only like slowly as local, as, as local for, firms gain a foothold in like you know, inter-regional international trade and so on and so forth and large scale finance um, that they begin to make use of the corporate form, right? So, you know, it's not, so, so like when we say there was demand for the corporate form in China in the, late 19, in, 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 the, in the 19th century, we don't mean that everybody wants to use it. We mean that there were large amounts of firms that were doing the kind of business that you would predict leads to the demand for the corporation. Nonetheless, those firms did not make use of the corporate form. Like so, like well, I, I'm talking about basically firms um, that try to engage in like large scale industrial production or large scale inter regional trade. Um, you know, like lots of these like shanxi oriented local firms that had networks all over the country. You would have imagined they, they you know, they, they certainly, and they had shareholders from all over the country. Like they would have benefited from having. Um, that diverse shareholders in the corporate form. Instead, they stick to the family, which as far as you know, the business, business historians can tell, um, was a constraint on their profitability, their scale, and so on and so forth. Um, so basically, like, whether a set of firms in China will, will even be interested in the corporate form depends on what kind of business they actually do. The our argument simply is that there seem to be enough of these firms in China at that point that there should have been demand. Yet nonetheless, the form, the form does, not, does not arise. Um, it, 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 it's also important to note that we don't predict that family firms uh, can survive and can flourish in a gazelle shaft world. They can. It's just that under certain contexts, when you're truly dealing with like truly inter-regional large scale economic activity, they likely can't outcompete compete um, corporations in a sustained fashion. Um, on the enforceability of contracts in the post model, like that's a really interesting question. Um, was there enough law enforcement? Well, so so this is where like I'm of perhaps like a different opinion than some of my my friends. Like I tend to believe that law enforcement in China was reasonably strong from the 1990s onwards. It was it was a wild west in the 1980s, sure. Um, but the, in the 1980s, there, 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 there also weren't a lot of like really private corporations. Most of the corporations that were being registered um, were these like you know joint ventures between like a village and a private party and so on and so forth. And so and things like that. It really wasn't until like the the, 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 the the second half of the 1990s, going into the early 2000s. Um, that these like large interregional private companies that didn't have any kind of like obvious formal state presence, they became major players in the company, uh, in, in the economy. And the thing is like by that point in time, um, the, the legal system was pretty functional. Like I put, put the, the point at which the Chinese legal system becomes a relatively robustly functional um, as a matter of enforcing basically you know, Basic, basic economic um, agreements between private parties at something around like 1987 when you pass the administrative um, litigation law, which is kind of like a sign internally that the courts have advanced to the point where they actually can be trusted with administrative disputes. Um, that is in, in, in the parties internal logic premised upon them being functional um, in, private, in, in private contract enforcement or property enforcement and so on and so forth. So I'd say that there wasn't this like disconnect at, 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 at any point in time in 
the post mill era where you have like large amounts of private corporations, really private corporations being registered. And yet um, the legal system was still not quite yet functional. I'd say that for the most part, the legal, the legal system came online um, before the private, before like true privatization and true private use of the corporate form um, occurred on a large scale. So thank you, thanks, th thanks again for the questions. And uh, let's go to the audience, I guess. Thank you, Professor Job. So now let's uh, ask some questions from the audience. So for time limits, maybe we can only have one or two questions from the audience. So I would uh, I would select uh, a question from Matthew uh, Nolet. Uh, let me read the question here. Functionally speaking, would it be possible to argue that business corporations branched of branched off of states of governments and the kind of modern macroeconomic division of labor, whereas previously the economic functions of such corporations were an integral or inseparable part of traditional state systems. In other words, modern corporations were not created, but simply became differentiated from the state. I guess this may be one extreme logical conclusion uh, of your current thinking. It seems like one could argue that traditional states played some kind of a role in asset uh, partitioning <clears throat> distributing risk in the economy of society at large. Uh, for example, the Imperial China Unified Welfare State. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, I'm very sympathetic to that way of thinking. Um, I do tend to think of like many modern corporations, frankly, as performing functions that you would traditionally assign to the state or in some kind of like Weberian ideal type, you would basically say that this, this is kind of like a state kind of power. Um, there's a like on this especially on this particular point. There, there's a disagreement between me and my co-author, who's a more kind of like traditional law and econ private law kind of person. Um, he wouldn't want to think this way. Like he would want to insist that private corporations maintain a certain level of privateness, and that the proper contrast is between you know contracts and the firm, the you know contract-based relationships and firm-based relationships, and between private between partnerships and corporations. But nonetheless, like, I, I, like what I think like that you can at least get from this kind of thinking is that like there's not a hard line between public and private organization. Instead, there's, a, there, there, there's like a spectrum, right? Um, on one end is like purely privatized contracts. You move from that towards like to, to, towards partnerships and, and, and various kinds of like non-limited non liability firms, Beyond that, you go to like corporations. Beyond corporations, you go into like various kinds of state, um, state private joint ventures and 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 and, and organizations, um, like not like NGOs and so on and so forth. Beyond that, there's the state, right? So like across the spectrum, there's a like there, there's a gradation of how much organizational capacity you actually have, um, how much collective governance is actually used. And frankly, the the corporation, in terms of like, um, in terms of functionality, probably has much more in common with the state than it does with the private con um, than, than it does with private contracts. So I am quite sympathetic to this way of thinking. But I, I suppose, like, given that I'm co-authoring with a person who doesn't necessarily appreciate that kind of thinking, it's going to be hard to push in this paper. Um, it's also true that we've already picked like a series of large enough fights in this one paper, and so perhaps like it would be best to not poke the corporate law literature in the eye even more than we have already. Okay, so now I think Professor Zhu Chen is waiting to join the discussion. Professor Chen. Uh, thank you, Zhu Chen. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Tyson, thank you for the uh, presentation. I just, uh, in the interest of time, um, maybe I, I have one quick point to add, uh, that is, in terms of the supply of uh, credible uh, credible commitment institutions, um, this general literature uh, has largely ignored um, another perspective. Uh, that is, um, in particular, this this uh, interesting book by uh, James McDonald uh, called uh, "A Free Nation Deep in Debt: uh, The Financial Roots of Democracy." <clears throat> 
Actually, McDonald uh, has done a great job uh, going uh, back to the very origin of government debt uh, in the Roman times. Now, uh, the uh, Republic of Rome back in, uh, in the, third, uh, the third century BC had to borrow debt. And that started uh, the Western societies sort of um, on a very different trajectory of development than the uh, Bronze Age civilizations uh, in the Middle East and then in Asia. Um, so because the uh, governments, especially in the uh, starting from the uh, 12th century uh, Italian city-states and then later on uh, in the English stage, uh, the Dutch state and so on, uh, who all had to uh, uh, often borrow uh, from uh, public investors uh, by issuing uh, bonds and so on. So that really uh, uh, made it um, possible for uh, societies in the West um, from the mid uh, Middle Ages onwards to really develop uh, institutions uh, that would make uh, you know intertemporal commitment, especially by the government more credible uh, when they would have to go to the debt market to keep borrowing money, money again and again. I mean, the, the, the early uh, uh, development of history of the, uh, the US also shows that, you know, Alexander Hamilton uh, had to really make this big jump uh, to um, make the, uh, uh, the, the commitment by the uh, young uh, United States of America uh, really credible. I, I think this this is uh, something uh, that is not so much talked about in the corporate uh, legal history uh, literature. Um, we often focus on the supply and demand uh, arising from um, the need for large corporations to raise capital and for large sums of uh, risk to be spread. Uh, but in fact, um, I think the the uh, you know uh, state the governments in the uh, uh, in the West very early on relied on uh, government debt uh, mm -hmm. to keep their government operating and to keep uh, the public utilities uh, operating in uh, Italy and other uh, West European uh, city states. Yeah, just want to add this. You know, Thank yeah, you. so, so th th that's a great point, and um, it actually feeds into this, this. This so 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 one one strand of literature that tries to understand the rise of the corporation in the West um, wants to see kind of like city governments in, in in medieval Europe as like prototype corporations, and of course, like part of it is because they have they employ certain kinds of technologies, for example, uh, separate legal personhood. Um, that you would commonly associate with the corporation, but at the same time, it's also because you know, like these 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 ent entities in, involved in financial activities um, that resemble corporate that, that resemble private act uh, private corporations more than they resemble like typical non-European states, right? So, so as as you mentioned, like the you know the Chinese state that does not issue public debt until pretty much like the. Um, the 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 late um, late nineteenth century, and even then it's largely a failure. And it really, it's really not until the twentieth century that there was public, public, there was any kind of public, public debt in China. Uh, at the local level, it's a little bit more foggy because you know sometimes there are these debt relationships between major kinship families and county magistrates and so on and so forth. But of course, like it's not it's never as quite as like institutionally formalized as it was in say Italian city states. Um, so, 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 like we've in this paper tried to sidestep that story by saying, that, like, let's just look at purely privatized business and not look at like basically state-driven debt because there the state is already there. Like, you know, in those kinds of contexts, the, the state is already present um, as a guarantor. It, it uses its, its coercive capacities to guarantee certain various kinds of debt and finance and various kinds of of economic activities. Um, that would seem to kind of like, in some ways, like make our point about state building a little bit too trivial because the state is always going to be there. 
And instead, you know, like what we want to look at is a realm in which the state, the state is traditionally not, as you point, point, point out, the state is not traditionally in that realm, the supposedly purely private realm of, of, of private business making. And to show that you know, like in that realm, certain kinds of organizational forms are really, really only, only usable um, when, once the state gets heavily involved. Um, so, so to some extent, going back to the previous question, like what we're arguing for is exactly some kind of blurring of the boundary between public and private, uh, and between state and state, and between between state and society. But we all we, we want to kind of like maintain some conceptual boundaries of you know the state coming in to provide a platform for, for private activity, instead of simply that like there's kind of like a more holistic merging. Of state and private into like one single entity, as you see in these, these um, in these uh, in these um, Italian municipalities and so on and so forth. So yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. Let me turn it to uh, to Chen. Okay. Thank you. So for time reason, let's uh, have the maybe the the last question from our audience. Uh, maybe we will leave the last question uh, to Professor David Mick. Uh, from University of Chicago. Uh, his question is, how do the examples of the Zaibasu in Japan and the Chibo in South Korea fit into your scheme? I'm not sure they are counter examples. I'm just interested in your interpretation of the um, so that's a great question. We we're like that's one of the next steps that we're going to take um, is to actually think about these. So I will confess to not having great familiarity with, like I, I have some basic knowledge of how Zaibatsu and Chai will function, and my my sense is that there there are two ways that I could go with this. But like pending more knowledge of how these things are actually organized, I don't know which way I should actually go. Um, one is to argue basically that. For especially in the, in the in the Japanese context, the, the Zaibatsu are heavily merged with this. Like, they're not formally merged with the state, but like their connections to the state um, are quite systemic. And especially if you look at their earlier history, um, like most of the Zaibatsu in the like kind of like, like it, it, during the Meiji era received huge amounts of government fund, um, government fund, uh, funding and financial backing. And so, to some extent, like it's not quite fair to say these were state companies. But their relationships with the state are far closer than what you would usually imagine as like the private private corporations um, stereotype in say the U.S. Um, the tribal, as far as I can tell, are, are different than that. Um, but like I, I do profess to like not knowing too much about how, like, how, South, how South Korean corporations actually function. It seems to me that they, they do make use of the corporate form. Which would basically just allows uh, allows the kind of sense that you know, like once you make use of the corporate form, there are all kinds of variations in which you actually make use of that, and we don't go like our our framework does not really predict how those variations play out. Um, the other road that we could possibly go down to is by saying that at some point, once once corporations become su um, sufficiently powerful. This is kind of also kind of like the reverse of the extension of the state question from before. Like once the corporation becomes large enough, powerful enough, they basically just kind of like co-opt the state, right? Um, you know, Samsung is not a state-owned company, but frankly, for all purposes, like it's effectively almost like a, a, a functional branch of the government, not because the government has co-opted it, but because it has co-opted the government to some extent, right? The government, necessarily has to make rules and institutions to make sure Samsung retains a certain amount of like competitive edge and remains a certain amount of functionality because it's so incredibly critical to the economy. It's, it's kind of, it's it basically you know, it, it, like, the intuition is like, if, if at some point a company becomes too big to fail, then it begins, it begins to assume certain kinds of like state-like functionalities. Um, and that could then just like, be the next step in our certain like be the next step in our argument, but of, of course like it's also because of like in, in my answer to, to Professor Chen like I mentioned like in this paper like we're we're preferring to keep the boundary between the state and the private sector at least like somewhat clear at least for for this analysis um, to some extent the the reason why we didn't go into Zaibatsu and Tribal is we came to the realization relatively quickly that the state 
the, the public private boundaries is, is, is exceptionally blurry um, in those cases. And hence, perhaps like those cases are best left to some other time when we can actually have more time to think about these things in a more nuanced fashion. This paper is more about like establishing like the really brute bright line boundaries um, that explain most, most of history, but the details in these cases, like, like, like especially at the margins, there are always kinds of variations um, that we have to think more about, but thanks. Okay, great. So thank you so much, Professor John, for your, for your uh, fascinating work. And uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for your discussion. And uh, uh, thank all the audience uh, who have many good questions here. So later we will forward all of your questions to Professor John for, for, for his consideration. So uh, then uh, in, in the re remaining of this month, we will have a short break and we will return in early uh, August. So next, the next event will uh, be a presentation by Professor Max Hao from Peking University on a paper about Chinese economic history in the Qing Dynasty. So please join our mailing list, uh, stay tuned, and I'll see you in early August. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very Bye. much.